This Week at NASA. All the companies here today are uh, commercially viable uh, as commercial spaceflight companies, I, no doubt in my mind. Officials from NASA and the companies participating in the agency's commercial crew program discussed the progress of CCP during a press briefing at the Kennedy Space Center. The partnership between uh, NASA and each of these companies clearly shows that uh, we have a very vibrant uh, space industry in the United States, and the space industry wants to meet the goal of getting uh, U.S. capability back into low Earth orbit. Through CCP, NASA is working with the Boeing company, SpaceX, Sierra Nevada, and Blue Origin to develop safe, reliable, and cost-effective access to and from low Earth orbit for potential government and commercial customers. February 11th is the scheduled launch date for the Landsat Data Continuity Mission from California's Vandenberg Air Force Base. LDCM will continue the Landsat program's 40-year tradition of monitoring Earth's landscapes from space. The new instruments to be flown on this mission, the Operational Land Imager and the Thermal Infrared Sensor, are an evolutionary step in sensor design with improved capabilities over previous Landsat missions. The four decades of data from Landsat constitutes the longest running record of the Earth's continental surfaces as seen from space. Observations by LDCM, a collaboration between NASA and the U.S. Geological Survey, will lead to advances in a wide range of Earth sciences, the management of agriculture, water, and forestry, and serve as a valuable resource for education, business, and government. NASA is deploying the Airborne Tropical Tropopause Experiment, or ATREX, to study key climate change issues related to the moisture in and chemical composition of the upper atmosphere. NASA's remotely controlled long-range Global Hawk aircraft will take measurements in the Pacific Ocean's tropical tropopause, a layer of the atmosphere between 40,000 and 60,000 feet above sea level. Our experiment is designed to look at processes that can affect global change, specifically the process of changes in the stratospheric water vapor, which we know can affect global change, which we know can affect uh, the overall temperature at the surface. New findings by NASA missions headlined the news at the 2013 meeting of the American Astronomical Society in Long Beach. Among them, the discovery by the Kepler spacecraft of 461 new planet candidates. Four of the potential new planets are less than twice the size of Earth and orbit in their sun's habitable zone. That's the region where liquid water might exist on the surface of a system's orbiting planet. Since the last Kepler catalog was released last February, the number of candidates scientists have discovered in the Kepler data has increased 20% and now totals more than 2,700 potential planets orbiting more than 2,000 stars. Meanwhile, two new images from the X-ray eyes of NASA's Nuclear Spectroscopic Telescope Array, or NUSTAR. The first reveals the brilliant glow seen in magenta of two black holes lurking inside IC342, a spiral galaxy seven million light years away. More than 10 times brighter than stellar mass black holes in our own galaxy. The brilliance of these ultraluminous X-ray sources, or ULXs, is a mystery astronomers believe New Star can help solve. Also captured by New Star, the first resolved image ever of the historical supernova remnant Cassiopeia A. Light from the stellar explosion that created Cassiopeia A took 11,000 years to reach Earth. While the star is long dead, its remains are still bursting with action. The outer blue ring is where the shock wave from the supernova blast is slamming into surrounding material, whipping particles up to within a fraction of a percent of the speed of light. New star observations should help solve the riddle of how these particles are accelerated to such high energies. Hello, I am Justin Lin, Mobility Dowling for the Mars Science Laboratory mission, and this is your Curiosity Rover Report. Over the winter holidays, Curiosity was parked at a location dubbed Grandma's House at Yellowknife Bay. 
At this location, Curiosity took a series of images to create panoramas of the surrounding area. In addition, the team downloaded as much data as possible from Curiosity to free up the onboard data storage space to give her a fresh start to the new year. Once the new year approached, Curiosity was ready to spin her wheels and stretch her arm. She started off with a three meter drive to an interesting feature called Snake River. Over time, dust has accumulated on all the rocks and it hides features such as fissures, inclusions, or pits that are of interest. At this location, the team selected a rock for the first time use of the dust removal tool. The tool has a set of spinning metallic brushes and this allows for the features to be exposed for unobstructed AP access or chem cam observations. While these activities are taking place, the team is searching for a suitable rock to test out the rotary percussive drill. This is a very exciting activity because it will be the first time that we will be drilling into a rock, acquire a sample from deep within the rock, and also sort and transport it to the science instruments on board Curiosity. This has been your Curiosity Rover Report. Please check back for more updates. The 2013 season of FIRST Robotics is underway. This year's international student competition that combines the excitement of sports with the rigors of science, technology, engineering, and math kicked off on NASA TV from Manchester, New Hampshire. The show revealed details of this upcoming season's challenge, Ultimate Ascent, involving flying frisbees and pyramids. All teams competing in FIRST for inspiration and recognition of science and technology get the exact same kit of parts with which to build their robots. Here's what happened at regional kickoff events sponsored by NASA Centers. In Cleveland, building anticipation among more than 150 students from 24 Northeast Ohio high schools as they learned about the ultimate ascent at their event sponsored by the Glenn Research Center. Opening their official first kit of parts, the students found a technological cornucopia of motors, batteries, a control system, a PC, and a mix of automation components, but no set of instructions. Then each student team began formulating its design plan for a robot that can fly as many flying discs into their goals as possible in 2 minutes and 15 seconds. Matches end with the robots attempting to climb up those aforementioned pyramids. I think this is probably the most excited that I've been out of my three years, especially because I've never worked with a robot who has to climb anything. It's a really interesting aspect that I've never worked with or programmed before. I know that throwing frisbees is really difficult. I'm gonna make, I'm making a robot that does that is gonna be such a challenge. And in Decatur, Alabama, the Marshall Space Flight Center hosted its first kickoff event at Calhoun Community College. Student teams from Alabama, Tennessee, and Mississippi were focused on NASA TV as this year's challenge was explained. And almost immediately after getting the details and their robot kits, teams began thinking about the best robot design for this season's challenge. We are really excited with this year's challenge. We look forward to seeing the discs fly and the points add up. We have team, a freshman team, a rookie team, who has just received its kit of parts and they're going through it. And we have teams here that have many years experience that have left and are ready to begin Ultimate Ascent. The winners of more than 30 regional competitions will face off at the first championships scheduled for April 24th through 27th in St. Louis. The main engine's up and running. Three, two, one, booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Atlantis on a 10-day mission to dock with Russia's orbiting outpost. Following its launch from the Kennedy Space Center 16 years ago on January 12, 1997, Atlantis became the fifth space shuttle to dock with the Mir space station. During the five days of STS-81's docked operations, the shuttle and station crews transferred nearly 6,000 pounds of water. U.S. science equipment, and Russian logistical equipment from Atlantis to Mir. The 10-day mission brought home astronaut John Blaha after a 118-day stay aboard the Russian complex. Among the seven-person Atlantis crew was John Grunsfeld, now serving as head of NASA's Science Mission Directorate. Oh, we have an image here on Mission Control. 
And seven years ago, on January 15, 2006, the return capsule from NASA's Stardust spacecraft landed in the Utah desert, completing its 2.9 billion mile round trip journey to collect dust samples from the tail of Comet Build 2. Research done on these particles revealed surprises, including the sample's closer resemblance to a meteorite from an asteroid than that of an ancient comet. Stardust is the first spacecraft to make it back to Earth with a comet's dust particles in tow. And that's This Week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, or to follow us on Google+, Flickr, and other social media, log on to www.nasa.gov.